It's really great to be here. I'm feeling a little nervous, but all of the other speakers have been like the best hype people. So I'm hoping I'm going to settle into it and feel a bit, bit better. Um, oh, we can't see my slides. Mm. Yay. Yeah. And we need the slides because they look really cool. Um, I'm going to be talking about HTML, but before I get into that, I need to say a special thanks to Burnt Toast Creative, who let me use their totally amazing illustrations in my talk. And most importantly, this is my dog, Jello. Um, and he does feature in my talk a little bit, so I like to point out that, that, that that's him. Uh, I work as a lead engineer at Octopus Deploy, Brisbane-based company, so some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, at Octopus Deploy, we kind of help to automate and simplify complex deployments, but uh, I'm not going to be talking about that today. I am going to be talking about HTML, which is really more of a, a passion of mine. And specifically, we're going to be talking about how you can embrace the simplicity of HTML to improve the performance and the accessibility of your websites and applications. Now, I'm going to be really upfront. HTML is super simple. But because it's simple, we often make the mistake of assuming that it's not valuable. And I'm really hoping I can dispel that way of thinking by the end of today and that you get something out of this talk uh, because HTML is something that we use in all of our websites, all of our applications, and it plays a really pivotal role in making our websites functional. And the way it does that is with the DOM tree or the document object model, which is constructed of what we provide the browser via HTML. We specify whether we want a heading, what kind of heading it should be, a paragraph, text, button, links, images. There's a whole suite of elements to best represent our content. I'm going to point out right now, this is the beginning of my dog propaganda, so just <laughs> look out for that. Uh, but in HTML, we also have the div, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, and the span. And they have no specific meaning, which means the content can be literally anything. The problem with this is if you choose a generic element, you're going to get generic output. And if you use it everywhere, you lose the benefits of the language. And the generic output is hugely problematic for uh, assistive technology in particular and other tech that rely on HTML to infer information about the page. Not everyone and everything that interacts with your websites and applications do it in the same way. There are many technologies that are going to try to use, read, and consume your content, and they rely on us using the language correctly in order for it to make sense. So whether that's a bot like Google Search Bot, reading apps like Safari's Reading Mode, text-to-speech tools, or assistive technology like a screen reader, it's not just our eyes that are consuming the content, and the DOM and the HTML play a really big role in how successful they will be. Now, much like the browser creates the DOM off our HTML, it also takes the DOM tree and it modifies it to form something that's really useful for assistive tech. And that's known as the accessibility tree. It uses the native semantics of HTML to create an interface for reading and navigating a page. So for example, a screen reader is able to interpret the accessibility tree and reproduce it as speech. The browsers like Chrome and Firefox have in accessibility inspectors. Um, that let you see what it looks like to uh, the assistive tech. But because the accessibility tree is made up of what we provide the DOM, if we provide it with a page that's all divs, like this one, what you get is just a bunch of sections and text leaves. So basically, it just thinks it's all text. If you compare that to a page that uses more structured HTML and applies the HTML more uh, accurately, you get a lot more information. You know if it's a paragraph or a heading, whether it's a list or uh, an image or a block quote. There's a lot more information the tech can use to infer information from the page. So a great way to demonstrate this is to listen to a screen reader. Um, we're going to start with the div only page um, using Apple's voiceover for Mac. Home. Good dogs, bad dog myths. Dogs, they are good. We are dedicated to educating the world on why dogs are good and how they can make your life good. By Mandy Michael, comma, August 3, road 2018. Why are dogs good? Dogs are loyal, intelligent, devoted, and affectionate. They are known to improve our physical and mental health. Mitchell and Jello, also known as Jello. Slash screen percent 20. Shot. 
I won't make you listen to the whole image. That was a screenshot from Instagram, which I didn't rename the file and didn't add an alt attribute to, so really, really awful um, name being read out. But you might have noticed a couple of other things. Firstly, the date said three road, doesn't make sense. Um, no headings or anything like that. But most importantly, it didn't tell us there were any links. Maybe you could figure it out from home, but otherwise the accessibility tree just thinks that the divs with my on-click event in JavaScript are text. So there's no way for the user to know that that is a link. If we compare that to a page with better HTML. Navigation main navigation one item, list three items. Visited, link, home, link, good dogs, link, bad dog myths, heading level one, dogs, they are good. We are dedicated to educating the world on why dogs are good and how they can make your life good. Mandy Michael, August 3rd, 2018, heading level two. Okay, I did fix the image too, but I won't make you listen to that. So obviously, I hope you noticed this was a lot better. The date was read out correctly. There were headings. Uh, the links, most notably, were read out. It told us how many there were, that we'd visited one. Overall, there's a lot more information for the user of the assistive tech, and this makes it a lot more functional. And this is just from a simple page, right? If you extrapolate this out to a complex interface, can you imagine how hard it would be to find a link if it wasn't, you weren't told that it was one? So by selecting our HTML more carefully, we're doing that heavy listing for the user and providing the assistive tech with the information and the context that it needs. But it's not just accessibility that benefits from a more considered approach to HTML, because overlooking HTML can lead to a large and messy complex DOM tree. And as users and scripts interact with your DOM, the browser has to recompute and position all of the styling and the nodes within the page. This can severely affect the runtime performance and the rendering of your page and applications. So for example, uh, Google's Lighthouse Performance Tool recommends less than 1,500 nodes, max depth of 32, and no parent with more than 60 child nodes. This seems like a lot, right? Um, it does warn at 800, which should indicate you want to be on the lower end of these numbers. But it's quite easily to exceed this by mistake, especially in the front end these days, we're doing a lot of component-based development. You add a div here and a div there and probably a bunch more divs over here. And it's easy to forget they all have to come together to form something on a single page. And as the accessibility tree is made up of what we provide the DOM, any performance impacts on the DOM further impact the accessibility tree. So a few years ago, I saw a really amazing talk by Eric Bailey. He's an inclusive design advocate. He currently works at GitHub. And he said that when the accessibility tree is slowed down by excessive code, it can create a lack of synchronization between the current state of the page and what's being reported by the assistive tech. This results in a mismatch between the page and what the user is presented with via the accessibility tree, which I'm sure you can imagine can be very, very confusing. You can kind of think of it like lag in a video game or bad dubbing or something like that. At the end of the day, Everything we put in our applications and our page websites adds up, even our HTML. So don't just throw things in willy-nilly. Dedicate some time to how you're using your HTML. So this was kind of a really long way of me saying don't just use divs. Um, I'm not saying don't ever use them. They do have a purpose. But just don't only use divs. And make sure you're using HTML the way that it's intended. So for example, headings are numbered for a reason use them in order. They provide a clear structure and hierarchy for the page, and when you use them out of order, you mess with that hierarchy. They're really important for a number of reasons. Um, Google Searchbot uses it to prioritize content on the page for the search results. Um, but most importantly, they're really important for accessibility. A lot of users of assistive tech will use headings in order to navigate the page, and they do this via tooling like shortcut keys in screen readers. But they also have something like this, which is the rotor. And it's kind of like a table of contents. It provides groups of information about the page, whether it's a heading, a landmark, images, uh, links. And it allows them to jump around the page easily. So if you don't use headings and you use divs instead, 
or you use them out of order, you mess with this structure and you take away their ability to navigate your page, which is, you know, terrible, right? We should also aim to use the named element for what we're building. If you have a header, use a header. Footers are footers, nav is nav, article is an article, label, label, form, form, button, button, section, section. Image is sort of close enough to image. <laughs> HTML is intentionally simple. They're named to help you out. It is not a trap. Now, I'm the first to admit it's not always that straightforward, but it's a really good place to start. It will 100% improve the accessibility tree and the accessibility for your users just by doing that. And it might even reduce the number of nodes simply because you're being more considered about the HTML you're using. And part of the reason for that is that you can make the most of the built-in functionality of HTML. There are a lot of useful features baked right into HTML that don't require more JavaScript, which is great. And they tend to work better across mobile operating systems and assistive tech. Not always, but typically that is more true than a random JavaScript library or bit of Stack Overflow code you copied and pasted. <laughs> There's a couple of examples, like the details element, which is like an accordion. The date input, I'm sure you're all familiar with, see it all the time. This is kind of a funny one because it's kind of one of those situations where it's great for discoverable dates, like appointments, terrible for things that are known, like date of birth, um, especially as you get older, like me, uh, and you have to click back more and more every year to find your year of birth, and it becomes a really humbling experience. <laughs> There's a great article called You Might Not Need a Date Picker. I've put it in my resources at the end, um, which I highly recommend everybody reads. Uh, but just know that when you do use it, you're saving yourself a lot of time and effort because day pickers are complicated. There's also tools like the dialog, which is like a modal, or the popover. Popover is new. It landed in all the major browsers this year. Uh, it's got a JavaScript API. It's got all this cool new CSS. It's kind of like used for toast notifications, content pickers, teaching UI, that kind of thing. And of course, the button. Buttons come with heaps of useful features, but it's still really common for people to do this. I know I've already done the don't use div scene, but buttons are a really good demonstration of why you should use the HTML features that exist, because they do a lot, especially for accessibility, like reporting to the accessibility tree and announcing via assistive tech, unlike divs which literally do nothing. Like, they're kind of useless other than for layout purposes. Same applies to the anchor element for links. If you use divs, then in order to replicate these features, you have to write more code, which you have to test and maintain. It's so much more difficult, whereas you could just use the button and get all that for free. When you make use of native functionality, it's like using a JavaScript library that already exists that's pre-built for you. It's one less NPM package that you need to install, which means it's less JavaScript, which means you have smaller bundle sizes, which is fantastic because that improves our performance. Now, for the last part of the talk, I'm going to focus specifically on HTML attributes that can help us improve the performance of our websites and our applications. I'm going to start with images because images typically take up more bandwidth than any other resource. And they tend to be one of the biggest impacts to performance. Now, there are a lot of things you can do to improve performance of images, manage your file sizes, use better image formats. But there are some simple HTML approaches you can take as well. And the simplest one, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is adding a width and a height to your image. The reason we want to do this is it helps to improve the impact of layout shift. And the way that we measure layout shift is a performance metric called the cumulative layout shift. It measures how much elements shift on the page as content is being downloaded. This applies to a few things like images and fonts. Um, but it, with images, it's particularly important because there's typically a delay between the HTML and the image being downloaded. And as a result, this can cause the content below the image to drop down the page, causing that layout shift. 
And this is super annoying, um, especially if you're on a slower internet connection and you've started reading and then things keep dropping in and you're like jumping all over the page and you don't know where you are. And if there's a lot of images, this can significantly increase the work that the browser has to do as it recalculates the layout every single time an image is loaded in. So by adding the width and height, you reserve the space for the image, the image can load in place, and you get rid of that layout shift. Of course, the introduction of responsive web pages made this a bit difficult. If you've been around for as long as I have, you would know we used to do this a long time ago. And then suddenly we had 1,000 pixel wide images on a 400 pixel wide screen, and that didn't work. So then we added in the source set property, which allows you to provide a comma separated list of file names with a width or density descriptor, so like DPI. In this case, I have Jello 1000, and the 1000W refers to how wide the image is. So in this case, this means basically that the browser doesn't have to download the image to know how wide it is. And you can combine this with the sizes attribute. Um, that allows you to define um, media queries, basically like in CSS, uh, that indicates like what size image you want based on some kind of condition. So in this case, I'm saying, at a min width of 1,000 pixels, give me a 1,000 pixel image. And then it goes to the source set and it says, I'll take that 1,000 pixel image, please. Now, if there isn't one that matches, it goes for the next biggest one. Um, this is kind of to avoid blurry pictures and stuff. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was lazy loading. Again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Essentially deferring the loading of an image until it reaches a particular distance from the viewport. Looks something like this. And as I scroll, each image is being loaded in rather than it all being dumped onto the page at the beginning of the loading the page. Now, previously, we would handle this. That's Sir Gelatin. It's on the wall in my house as you walk in. It's magnificent. Um, previously, we would handle this by using the intersection observer or event handlers like scroll and resize. Uh, but we don't need that. Um, HTML has had native lazy loading for images in particular for quite some time. You use the loading attribute with a value of lazy, and that's it. Um, it's not it actually it. But because you've listened to what I've just said, you will be adding a width and a height to your images. If you don't add that, uh, it won't work. It won't lazy load, particularly in Chrome. They'll just ignore it. Um, and that's because uh, you're kind of negating the effects, the performance benefits by it having to recalculate the layout. So do include the width and the height if you're going to lazy load. You can also use it on iframes as of the beginning of the year. All the browsers supported that as well, which is great if you've got ads and stuff like that. Um, now, the reason that I wanted to mention this specifically is very recently, I don't know how recently it is actually, but with all these JavaScript frameworks on the front end, they're all being really helpful, making all these um, image components and image management tools uh, that lazy load by default, which is fantastic, usually. But it's really important that you only lazy load images that are not visible within the viewport when the page first starts loading. If the image is in view when the page first loads, it's considered part of the largest contentful paint. That's a performance metric that refers to the render time of the largest image or text block that's visible in the viewport when the page first starts loading. If you try and lazy load an image, so defer loading the image for that largest contentful paint, it's going to negatively impact your performance because it's not going to be ready quick enough. So if you're using any of these frameworks that have lazy loading by default, do make sure you're resetting it for those images in the top part of your page. Um, it's, the value is eager, um, but different libraries have different ways to reset it. Just make sure that you do it, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. Now, there's a bunch of other things you can do with images, like aspect ratio, but I'm going to move on and talk about uh, optimizing loading and prioritization. Because when a browser loads a page, it doesn't just sequentially download each resource as it needs them. Instead, it looks at the whole HTML document, decides what resources it's going to need, and then it starts to load them based on what it thinks it needs first. And how it makes these decisions does vary between browsers. So the order of prioritization can directly impact your performance, simply because as you prioritize one thing, you're going to deprioritize another. 
If you send the JavaScript first, images are going to be delayed and vice versa. And this is very important to consider for render blocking resources like JavaScript and CSS because they have to be downloaded in full before they can be applied and executed. To help manage this, HTML introduced a few things. The first one is the fetch priority attribute, which allows you to specify the priority of resources uh, like CSS, fonts, scripts, and images. It's got three values, high, prioritize it, low, deprioritize it, and auto, which is browser, you can make the decision. Now, often when people use this, they expect that setting it to high makes it the highest priority and setting it to low makes it the lowest priority. But that is not what happens. What it does is it sets a relative priority. So it's going to raise or lower that priority by an appropriate amount based on the browser's pre-existing rules. So for example, uh, this is Chrome-based. Style sheets in Chrome are considered the highest priority. So if you set a fetch priority of high, Chrome's gonna go, oh, you think that's important? I also think that's important. So we will make it the highest of priorities. If you set it to low, it's gonna go, oh, you don't think that's important, but CSS is really important for rendering the page, so I'll deprioritize it a little bit, but it's still gonna be a high priority. So in neither of these scenarios are we explicitly saying this is a high priority and this is a low priority, and that's the value it'll get. A really good use case of fetch priority is if you're doing a marketing site, you've got that big carousel with that big image, and then there's all these other images that you can't see. If you set fetch priority to the first image, you're going to download that one much quicker than the remaining images that are not visible, that you don't need immediately. This is going to improve that lattice contentful paint if the carousel is in that top part of your page. So you can make some good performance improvements by applying it in places like this. Browser support's really good. It actually landed in Firefox, the last one we were waiting for last week, which is awesome. Um, that said, if you're supporting older browsers, you can still use it. Um, one of the benefits of HTML is that typically, if the browser doesn't understand something, it just ignores it. Um, so you can use it without worrying about it breaking anything. There's also an associated JavaScript API for it as well. So the last thing that I want to talk about is resource hints. They're really useful uh, for informing the browser how to load and prioritize your resources. I love that I managed to find illustrations that kind of worked with this, so good. So the first two options that we're gonna look at are pre-connect and DNS prefetch. And you use these within the link element in the head of your document with the rel attribute with the appropriate value. So first up, DNS prefetch kinda does what you might expect. It tells the browser to perform the DNS lookup straight away. Now this will save maybe a few milliseconds. And that's probably like, well, why would you bother? But if there are a lot of external resources, there might be dozens of DNS lookups required per page. News websites have this problem, for example. So it all adds up, so you can shave quite a bit of time off by using this just to cut that time down. The next option is pre-connect, which does what DNS prefetch does, but it also includes the TLS negotiations and the TCP handshakes. It eliminates the round trip latency and saves even more time by doing that ahead of time. What it doesn't do is load any actual resource. We'll talk about that in a minute. But essentially, you're telling the browser you want to establish a connection to another domain and you want it to happen ASAP. This is really handy for things like image CDNs, streaming media, Google Fonts use this to um, make connecting to Google Fonts quicker. And back in 2019, Chrome actually managed to improve the time to interactive, which is the time that you can first interact with the page, by almost a second by pre-connecting their important origins. Uh, so you can save quite a bit by doing this without actually having to download any resources. Now finally, we have preload, which is probably the most well-known HTML attribute for uh, performance-related features. And we use this similar to the other examples on a link element with the rel attribute with a value of preload. 
Now, with this, it's really important you do a couple of things. Firstly, uh, you want as uh, and tell it what kind of resource it is, like script or fonts or, or images. Um, this is really important for prioritization. Um, and it's really, really important to make sure that uh, it knows how to prioritize that within their rule system. You should also make sure you specify what kind of resource, oh, sorry. There's another one that I didn't put on here called type, um, which you can use for fonts. Um, that's not as important. But one of the most important things to do if you start to preload fonts is use the cross origin attribute. If you don't, it's going to download twice. Um, and the reason for this is that fonts by default are considered a cause request. So if you preload a font and you don't add cross origin, you're going to lose the whole benefit you would have gotten from preloading because uh, it's just going to download it again later. So do make sure that you do that. The other place that you can use preloading uh, is with the image source set that I talked about earlier. You can add uh, the attribute image source set with the source set comma separated list of images, uh, and that will preload those so that they're ready for you when you need them later. Do make sure that they're the same, though. Uh, one thing to note here is that in this case, you don't have a href because otherwise it can accidentally download the wrong image. So the link element, though it typically would have a href, it doesn't in this case. Now, you should only preload resources that are needed for the initial rendering of the page. If Chrome, in Chrome, for example, if uh, you use preload um, and it's not completed in three seconds, it'll complain because you didn't actually need it as quickly as you said you would. This is super common and people mistakenly use it incorrectly all of the time and they kind of preload all of the things, which is why tweets like this exist from people like Zach Leatherman. Um, when you preload everything, nothing is important, right? In response to that tweet was this tweet by Robin Marks, uh, and it's the perfect way to explain why you need to be careful about how preload is used. So what we have here is HTML, JavaScript, and an image. And in the first example, the image's request is deferred until after the JavaScript, uh, and it's downloaded one after a time, takes about 2.25 seconds. With preload, if you're lucky, the image request is initiated alongside the render blocking request, and it finishes a lot quicker, which is kind of what we're aiming for with preload. Unfortunately, what often happens is the bottom example, where the image and the JavaScript fight for priority and bandwidth, meaning that it actually takes longer than if you just not preloaded in the first place. So it's important that you use preload for critical resources, um, you use it in the right place, and that you test that you're not making things worse. You can use preload for assets that uh, aren't loaded by the HTML directly, but are critical to the experience of the page. So for example, um, resources inside your CSS, like um, images, fonts, that kind of thing. Preload's very good for fonts. Just for reference, I have a whole separate talk about that. Uh, also, same for JavaScript, things JavaScript can request, like JSON, web workers, imported scripts, or critical bundle, uh, like parts of your JavaScript bundles. And of course, large files like video, really good for that as well. Things that might take a while to download. Things inside CSS and JavaScript are hard to find by the browser, so that's why preloading them can be really helpful. So to finish off, I want to mention briefly early hints, which is not HTML. It is a HTTP status code. It defines new interactions between the client and the server. And the reason I wanted to mention it is you can use everything that I just talked about with early hints. Preconnect, DNS prefetch, preload, fetch priority. I love a bit of transferable knowledge. But what it will do is allow the browser to preconnect to sites or start preloading resources even before the server has prepared and sent the final response. Looks a bit like this. This is from MDN. And what I love about this is if you're learning this in early hints or HTML, you're also learning it for the other, right? And sometimes you might find that preload works better in early hints for your purposes, uh, or it might work better in HTML. Just kind of depends. It's a great place to experiment and to use the knowledge 
across different places. Really good browser support at the moment. Uh, not currently supported in Safari, though. So with that, please make the most of your HTML. You can make things more usable. You can make things more useful, not just for performance and accessibility, but for your users and different technologies as well. And all by using a technology that you're already using, just like a little bit better than you were before, there is so much to be gained from using HTML well and making the most of its features, and there's absolutely nothing to lose. Thank you so much. I guarantee you this goes to GitHub. I'm not trying to trick you. Um, all my resources are up there. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be around. Please feel free to reach out to me, especially if you want to talk about my dog. Thank you. Thank you.